never to forget. And yet, we rejoice in what he continues to do. See, what he's done, this is, this is the start of something amazing. And it continues, even today. Not only what has he done, but what is he doing? And sometimes I'm, I'm hard-pressed to, to find things that may be a good segue into the message. This week, not so much, because I want to talk about what's going on in a Christian school called Asbury in Kentucky. And if you haven't heard, there's something, uh, something happening. Something happening in Kentucky at this Methodist school. I know some of you are like, even among the Methodists. God's doing something, right? And uh, some people call it revival. Some people call it awakening. There's definitely something happening. And I, and I want to take a moment because this does tie into the message. And so I'm going to use this as an opportunity to, to, to just talk about this. Because I think sometimes maybe we're at a loss of what is happening. And perhaps our mind is filled with Questions like, is this of God? Is this biblical? Some of you may approach things a bit more skeptical. Who are the skeptics in the crowd? Just raise your hand. Okay. You guys, we'll, we'll make you sit on that side next week, all right? Uh, but here, here's what's exciting. God's doing something. And he's doing something among these young people, and, and, and if you study the history, and I know this sounds like a fascinating study, of revivals or awakenings in America, how many of them spring forth from universities and colleges? A lot. Matter of fact, if you go back to Jonathan Edwards and Yale in 1700s, something profound happened there. It became other Ivy League institutions. Things happened in L.A. in the early 1900s to kind of lead into modern Pentecostalism. Um, just so you know, Asbury, where this revival awakening is happening, this is the ninth one in the past hundred years. This is not unique. This is the ninth one that God is saying, I'm going to do something here, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to spill out and spread. And so people are, are, it's like a pilgrimage. People are like leaving their jobs and going to Kentucky to, to witness firsthand what, what's happening. Now, as a pastor, I've been talking to people. They've been asking me, what are your thoughts on this? And um, let, me, let me just, here's how I frame what God's doing in two words. Number one, the word is fruitfulness. Write this down, fruitfulness. The question isn't so much, what is God doing right now? My question is, what will be the long-term effects of what is happening right now? So my thought is, and I think this is a biblical way to approach things, is it's easy to get wrapped up into emotionalism and, and the feelings, and, and those things aren't bad, but we do not rely on emotions and feelings as any sort of gauge of objective reality or truth. So my thought is, cool, I'm excited what God's doing. I pray that Jesus is being lifted up. I pray the word is centered. I pray that God is glorified, right? And then the true test of if, if this is of God is, where will people be a month from now, a year from now, 10 years from now? I'm praying for great things to come out of this moment. So fruitfulness is, is one of those words I think of. And so I want to pray that God is igniting something that our culture so desperately needs, right? And among these young people, and again, young people are searching for the same thing that we are, uh, as far as those of us that are maybe a little older, maybe a little younger. It's this, we, we're looking for something of meaning and significance and purpose and value. Because the things that this world offers us is so dissatisfying. No wonder there's an outbreak of, of God. Because only he can satisfy our hearts. So I think about fruitfulness, and I'm praying, God, bring something wonderful out of this moment. But there's also the second word I want to give you, and it's foolishness. Because there have been revivals and awakenings that have not been fruitful, but have been foolish. There was a movement in Toronto called the Toronto Blessing a couple decades ago, where there was this outpouring of God, and the manifestation of this outpouring was people barking like dogs. 
that doesn't sync with a God that I, I know from Scripture, right? This, you know, or another movement where people are being slain in the spirit and flopping all over the floors. That tends to be a little bit more disorderly or chaotic. So please refrain your barking and your flopping for, for some other time, all right? But, but we, we ought not be foolish, right, and carried away by these, these, these feelings and these experiences. Um, we are to be thoughtful, we're to be thinking Christians, right? The, the true question is not how does this make me feel. Instead, it should be, is this true? The, the questions we should be asking is, is, you know, not will it divide or, or will it offend, but is it right? And, and I tell you what, God brings through these moments, if there's reconciliation with him through the cross of Jesus Christ, then this is of God. If Jesus is front and center, if the word is being uh, discovered once again and, and people are having a passion for the word, this is of God. If there's reconciliation not only going on between us and God, but one another, people being reconciled and broken and repentance, I think those are, those are the works of the Spirit. And so what will the fruitfulness be? Let's guard our hearts against foolishness. Let's pray that God's doing something. Because here's the problem. If you live by emotions rather than right thinking, it's going to produce instable people. And there's enough instability already in our lives. We don't, we don't need to add to it, which brings me to our topic this morning. And that is the importance of the Word of God, which I will say is not only the authority of God given to us, but its objective truth and reality shows us what's appropriate and what's right about him, about us, about the, 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 the course of our, our normal day and existence in this world that he's created us to live in. Uh, you know how important the word of God is to Missio Dei. You know how important it is. There's not a Sunday that doesn't go by where I don't use these words, open your Bibles. But you would be amazed at the famine of the word of God in the land where there's no bringing your Bibles even to church. There's not even maybe a reference to it. There might be a reference, but that's their way of just kind of getting in. Like, here's the one verse, now let's talk about, you know, your Enneagram. Or let's talk about your love language. Or let's talk, let me just tell you right now, we are desperate for the word. Let me, let me rephrase that. I am desperate for the word. And every Sunday is just me working out my stuff with God before you, and then hoping some of you go, hey, I'm in that group too. And I go, oh, cool, I'm not alone in this. So you're all allowed to listen in at this moment to me in this cathartic time with you. Amen? Turn your Bibles to Acts 17. Good news is we don't have to live our, our lives in Christ by human imagination. We don't have to live our lives in Christ by intuition. We must live our lives by divine revelation. We affirm the revelation of Scripture, the authority of God's Word to be this. The 66 books of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation are God's breathed out love letter, will, heart to us. And if you're remiss in understanding the word, you're remiss in understanding your God who loves you and wants to walk in daily relationship with you. Can I just say one other note about the revival is you don't have to pack up your things and go to Kentucky and witness what God is doing. Because as Jesus said to the woman in John chapter 4, this is not about where, this is about who and how you worship God. So many t again, people want to go see, uh, my, my encouragement to you is save the plane ticket, give it, to, give it to the church, how's that sound? Give that money to the church, and just be a part of what God's doing here, because God is everywhere all the time. And the same awakening and revival that's taking place there is, is happening in our hearts, even in a little coffee house in Chandler, Arizona, this very moment. It's not about where, it's about who and how. Are you worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth? Because those are the kind of people the Father seeks to be his people. That's what John 4 says. Isn't that awesome? We can just say amen and go home at this point, but we're not going to. <laughs> Acts 17, turn there in your Bibles if you would. Uh, boy, I'm praying that we would become like the Berean church. What we're going to look at in these handful of verses is I, I hope it's going to encourage you. I hope it's going to stir up, stimulate something. Uh, but I'm super excited about this because the Bereans have always been one of my favorite 
people to understand. Verse 11 perhaps is one of my all-time favorite verses in the Bible. And I know some of you are like, you always say that about every verse. Well, okay, so it's, it's, that's my problem, all right? So, uh, but verse 11 is so good, and I, and I try to pray this for my own life, but for the, for the culture of, of this church community too. Look at Acts 17, verse 10. And the br- brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now there were more noble-minded, those people, than those in Thessalonica. How's that for like a little like insult moment? Like these people were a little bit smarter than those in Thessalonica, but we won't digress, right? For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men, But when the Jews of Thessalonica heard that Paul was up to his shenanigans once again, they got mad, they were agitated, they stirred up the crowds, and they went and they sought Paul out in Berea to disrupt the work of God that was going on there, right? And then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea. So they sent him on a cruise. I don't know if it was Royal Caribbean or Disney or what, but he was on a cruise ship, leaving Silas and Timothy behind. And those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, which we get to look at next week, which is another f- fantastic passage of Scripture, um, and, and, uh, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, and then they departed. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. Four things we're going to look at. The first one is this, emptiness and reaching with the word. We will never be satisfied apart from God. And we will never be satisfied apart from understanding who this God is, what he has spoken, and how we are to digest and consume all that he's entrusted to us by his word. This is why Paul and the other apostles, disciples, are so set on taking this gospel message everywhere they go is because men and women are empty and they're tired of what the world keeps feeding them. Every single one of us is empty. You and I, we're all empty. And until we're filled by Christ, our pursuit to find that satisfaction will be an unceasing and unending pursuit. And yet we realize, and we've seen this happen with Paul, even in the past couple cities he's been to and run out of, uh, that there are men and women receiving the wor- word and, and finding satisfaction and contentment in Christ and Christ alone. Think about the, the governor on the island of Cyprus who receives Jesus. His life is changed. Think about Lydia, the businesswoman who's got a penthouse in Hollywood and penthouse in New York, l- successful, and yet nothing would appease her heart like Jesus, and she embraces Jesus, and her house turns into the biggest Bible study in, in, in the city. Uh, a demon-possessed slave girl comes to know Christ. A retired jailer comes to know Christ. The gospel of Jesus is for everybody. Why? Because we all come to God with the same emptiness. And that is that God-shaped vacuum that Blaise Pascal, French scientist, said some 200 plus years ago, there's a God-shaped void in every single one of us that only God can fill. And so Paul realizes that this is human nature. And that there's this emptiness that exists all over the world. And the only thing that God has called us to do, like Paul, is to reach those people with the word. Nothing else is going to satisfy. And I love it because here's Paul. And you you have to kind of laugh. Like verse 10, you go, so the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night. How many times is Paul sent away by night? Literally, the question is, how many times has Paul run out of town? I mean, this is on his resume. Is this the kind of pastor you want to hire? Right? Like, so I've seen you've been run out of eight cities in the past six months. Uh, will you come and be our pastor? Like, who's open to this? Like, because they're like, where did Paul go? Oh, he's gone again. <laughs> well, great. That pastor had only lasted two days, right? Like, but Paul never sees this as retreat. He always sees it as advancement. And that is a mentality we need to embrace. Wherever God takes you, whether you like where you're at or not, it is an opportunity for the people to be reached with the word. Right? Like, wherever you go, whether it's a prison cell and you're singing at midnight, whether it's down by the river and you're hanging out with a a Bible study of women, 
It doesn't matter. The word is always appropriate. The word is always available. And what better stuff is it to talk about, especially when there's hungry souls on the line? So Paul is not retreating and being run out of cities. He's advancing the gospel. And so emptiness, Paul goes, there's no emptiness. It's opportunity to meet people in their emptiness with the word. Nothing satisfies like the word. I'm going to rob that from Snickers. How dare they take that? Jesus always satisfies. Amen? Point number two. Then you see him go to Berea, which is about 40 miles away from Thessalonica. So again, these guys are, they're walking. You know, it's not like they Uber or Lyft. They're, you know, like, hey, how long is it going to, and how much is it going to take? They're walking from city to city to city. Day's journey. They go to Berea. First thing they do, they find a synagogue. People who are already opening the Old Testament, people who are already spiritually sensitive, spiritually inquiring. So Paul says, hey, let's go find a synagogue. There's a synagogue of the Jews in Berea. And these Jews were more noble-minded. Now, if you think that's an insult, it probably is a little bit to the Thessalonican believers who were a little bit more closed-minded. But why were they noble-minded? Well, it describes it right here. Because these, these Jews received the word with great eagerness, examine the scriptures daily and they wanted to see whether the things Paul was teaching were in accordance with the Old Testament. So there's several things here. This is probably why it's one of my favorite verses. So circle verse 11. Let's dive into this for a few minutes. First thing you need to understand it says they were eager. They were receiving the word with eagerness. Literally it means they were rushing forward meaning you couldn't hold them back. They were so excited. They were like thinking to themselves the night before. They're like, oh, I can't wait for tomorrow. I can't wait for tomorrow. We get to be together. We get to open the Old Testament. We get to look at the, the word of God. And they're, and they're prancing and dancing like this. And the moment the door opens, they're rushing in. No one came in this morning like that to this place. <laughs> if anything, here's what I saw. People walking in like, where's my coffee? I hope the music's good. I hope it's not too loud. How come they ran out of programs? Why is pastor throwing Bibles, right? Whatever it is, you're just not like rushing in, right? Like eager and like hungry, right? Like I don't sense that. That's why these people were so noble-minded. They're already wanting to understand the word. They haven't come to, yet to know Jesus, but there's something creating this insatiable appetite that they just can't wait See, in Thessalonica, they, they, the, the Jews up there already prejudged the message of Paul. They were jealous of what Paul was teaching. These people, they were sensitive and responsive. Three things. You want to become more eager? You want to become more that I'm going to rush forward because I'm so excited for what the, the, the word is going to say? How it's going to speak? Three things. Number one, you need to come with a reception of humility. Here's one thing I know that I continue to, to, to grow in, and that is the cry of the psalmist, which should be our cry daily, teach me, O oh God. I am lost. I am wayward. I'm battling sin. I'm making poor choices. My marriage, my kids, my work, Nothing's where I would like it to be. It's probably not even near what you want it to be. I come to you broken. And I come to you repentant. Teach me, oh God. Because I don't know anything apart from you. And how dare I even try to navigate life as if there's one bit of wisdom I can muster up of my own. Teach me. Oh God. There has to be this attitude of what am I expecting from you, oh God? Because somehow my expectations of you reflect more of what I want from myself than what you want of me. I mean, let me ask you that question. What are you expecting out of the next 30 minutes? I'm going to guess probably some of you haven't even thought about that. I tell you what we ought to be expecting. God speaking. 
Do you hear his voice? He, he's talking. It's not going to come in the thunder. You're not going to see it in the lightning. We, we would love the whirlwind, but God says it's that still, small voice. It, it, it's, it's, this, it's this spirit of humility that says we don't have it figured out. I'm going I'm to tell you right now, our problem, ladies and gentlemen, is not busyness. It's self-confidence. Because how many of us treat God as if, I give you that Sunday morning to speak to my life, but Monday through Saturday, we've got it. We, go ahead, God, rest. I got the rest. I got, I got the rest of the days of the week. Self-confidence breeds pride. Humility breaks you down so that you are desperate for God daily. We wonder why we're empty and dissatisfied and discontent and angry and hostile and bitter and resentful and unforgiving. And we treat God as if he's just our valet on Sunday. But the rest of the week, I got it. I mean, in the words of, of Paul, you, you don't got it. He says that somewhere. You don't got it. James 1, 21. Look what it says. James writes these words. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness, humility, the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Do away with all the stuff the world says. Oh yeah, busy yourself with this. I mean, think about it. Eagerness starts the night before. Like we're coming together on Sunday morning. My prayer for you starts days before this. My preparation for what God wants to say to me and us starts days before right now. And this means like even the night of, the before we're going to gather, I don't want my mind to be filled with SNL or, or love is blind. My mind needs to be filled with this eagerness saying, God gets to speak tomorrow. Are you, are you going to be there? Oh yeah, I haven't thought about that. <laughs> what? There's a sense of we are desperate for him, which leads to point number two, which ties it. It's a reception of honesty. Let's just stop playing games with one another and pretending everything is, is perfect. None of us have it all together. Woohoo! High five each other right now. Because we're all in the same group together. Honesty is when God really begins to work. You try to portray to be someone you're not, First John, bonus verse, is not up on the screen. Just write down First John chapter 1. If you say you live in the light, yet live in the darkness, you deceive yourselves and you're a liar. <laughs> How's the word for just cutting right just to the quick? God does his best work when you are broken and repentant and willing to come to terms with what he's saying about your life. You can say whatever you want about your life. What does he say about you? And I'm going to tell you right now that we need to give heed to the word as if God himself was speaking through some human instrument like your pastor. I, I don't take this job lightly. Just for a reminder, I'm a fallible human being. Can everyone give an amen to that, please? Yes, I'm fallible. The word is infallible. How the transmission works between something of infallibility through someone who is fallible, only the Spirit can orchestrate what the Spirit needs to orchestrate. I tremble because I understand James 3 says the teacher will incur a stricter judgment. I understand that. Welcome to my world. Try to bear a little bit of that burden and anxiety. But my prayer is that you wouldn't say, well, Pastor Scott said this. I don't want that to come out of your word. I want you to say the word of God says this. 
however it comes through this human instrument, I pray that God's word would be understood in the way it needs to be understood, not how I want you to understand it. And it requires an open mind and a cautious heart. God wants your heart as well as your mind. We're to love our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. See, the problem when we come to God, sometimes we come with cloudy minds and open hearts, or we come with closed hearts and clear minds. And we need both to be open, receptive, humble. We need to, to say, God, I need to be aware of things that maybe I'm not aware of. I need to pray like the psalmist does in Psalm 19. Like, make me aware. I know the things I'm aware of. Help me be aware of the things I'm not even aware of, the sins of omission, the sins of commission. God, search me and see if there be anything in me that is not in accordance with your character or your will. You pray that. Be careful. Because God will reveal what he wants you to see and understand and know. But the disciple in Christ, point number three, is hungry for this. Reception of hunger. We under, the person who doesn't know Christ doesn't understand this, this desire. And that is really what it is. What I'm speaking of is not obligation. What I'm speaking of is desire, and a desire that says, I long for you, O God. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. Right? I love how Peter talks about this. This is, this is great. P- First Peter chapter 2, he says this, Just like little babies, newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that that by it you may grow up into salvation if you indeed have tasted that the Lord is good. So if you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, there's going to be a desire in you for his food. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You remember when Jesus laid that on us in Matthew chapter 4? Right? Here's what you have to understand. Have you ever handled a hungry baby? I'm going to tell you right now, it almost requires lion taming skills. I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. I remember some three kids, right, that are now teenagers. I will never forget those hungry moments. And, and there's two gestures a hungry baby, at least our hungry babies had. One was like this. When they heard that food was about ready to happen, whether they were little, 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 or they heard someone in the kitchen preparing something, the two gestures were this. First was like this. Like, it didn't matter where you were in the house. These kids were like. <laughs> like, I go, wow, okay. And then the second, when they were, like, really little and, and probably, you know, mommy was, was nursing them, they're like. <laughs> they're just looking for something to put their mouth on. Like, <laughs> I'm ready to eat. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, Peter probably had this in mind. Like, when was the last time you approached the word like this? <laughs> or like this? <laughs> but that's, that's the picture. There's intense hunger and that God can only satisfy this with his word. And I sit there and go, is, could it be problematic that people aren't? <laughs> I pray for a Berean appetite for our, our church today. I pray for a Berean appetite to happen because I want churches, not just our church, but all churches to be filled with people who are longing for this biblical food, who are clamoring to get in together, to open the scripture, to find out what God is saying, to feast upon his word, to to feast upon his will. Unfortunately, our churches are filled on Sunday morning with cotton candy, entertainment, funny stories, pithy anecdotes, talks about love languages, talks about Enneagrams, and let me just tell you, God doesn't care one bit about any of those things. He cares if his word is open. He cares if his people are hungry. One of the marks that you are in Christ is this. Are you hungry and thirsty for righteousness? Because if you are, you will be satisfied. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Do you hunger? Because I'm going to tell you right now, Only the Spirit can stimulate that appetite. In Christ, you've been given the the mind of Christ. In Christ, you've been given this Holy Spirit who now loves to take the Word 
and do something in you and through you. Matter of fact, write down chapter John 14, John 16. And let me isolate one verse, not on the screen, I'll give it to you, bonus. Chapter 16 of John, verse 14. One of the works of the Spirit will to be bringing to our remembrance all that the words of Christ have taught. If you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be satisfied and be assured you are in Christ yourself. If there's no hunger and thirst, if there's no panting for the water like the deer pants for the you ought to question where you're at with God. I mean, that's how serious this is. God doesn't want acts of worship. He wants a heart of worship. Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness today? Point number three, examination. So, there's this eagerness, but it's not an eagerness that doesn't involve our brains which is good, right? We, we want to be zealous, but we want that zealous to be founded in, in love and truth. It's not a zeal that's just unbridled. And so what they do is then this church in Berea examines the word. They research the word. Look what it says. So they with great eagerness examine the scriptures daily. So here's what I love. They're like, okay, Paul, you unpack this for us. We're going to take all our notes home and we're going to look at these things daily. We'll get back to you what we find out. It's like, almost like they investigate what, what Paul's saying. Now remember, this is the Apostle Paul. You want, you want to talk about something humorous? This is the greatest theologian that's ever stepped foot in the world. He's written thir- at least 13 books of the New Testament. And they're basically saying to Paul, we don't care who you are. We don't care what your pedigree is. We don't care if you're funny or if you're like scholarly. What we care about is what you're saying and does it line up with the Old Testament. So we'll get back to you, Paul. And you know what I love? Paul doesn't fight it. Here's here's how you know Paul's being worked on by God. He's not offended like, don't you guys know who I am? Just take it at face value. No, they're like, no, no, no. We'll look at this. We'll get back to you. I love that. I love that. Matter of fact, I love a church culture that's saying, Pastor, you can really sell something with your energy and with your excitement and with your enthusiasm and your big smile. I've got the gift of woo. You know what woo means? Winning others over. I do this quite well. But I never want someone to make a decision based upon the presentation. I want people to see it for themselves and be moved as if it was the most boring speaker or the most charismatic speaker. I want to come back and hear what you have, study what you had to say and come back next week and for you guys to go, I looked at it, you're right. Woohoo! Celebration! Don't just, don't just believe it because I said it. Believe it because this is what the Word of God declares. Amen? So here we are, and, and I get the advantage of doing this. I've, I've been in this passage for five, six days. You're just now hearing it for the first time. So I realize you need some time to kind of mull it over. But my prayer is that we do such an honest look at the scripture that in the end, you're going to come out with the same conclusions I came to. Why? Because it's God who has spoken. Amen? Because while this is about doctrine, because I believe in doctrine, here's what I don't believe in, indoctrination. Do you know what the difference is? Doctrine is a message that has theological content. All my messages have theological content. Why? Because we're all theologians. We all think things about God, whether they're right or whether they're wrong. We all think things about God. The problem with indoctrination is that there's then a tyrannical instruction demanding uncritical acceptance, and I don't want that for you. I want you to see things the way the Bible is sharing them with us. Three things to understand in this point. Number one is that there's spiritual discernment that's involved. Spiritual discernment. What do I mean by that? Meaning acceptance of something without discernment is not a Jesus-honoring virtue. This is how cults get started. (laughs) They all have Jesus. They all have some semblance of the word, 
but there's not discernment. There's just this blind acceptance, and this is how cults start. So we don't want to start another cult, okay? Amen. What we want to do is we want to examine the scriptures to see if what is being taught is accurate. We believe in the whole counsel of the word of God. What does the Bible say from Genesis to Revelation? So in this context, Paul is telling these Jewish people who are familiar with the Old Testament, you have the Old Testament, but you don't have the hero of the Old Testament. His name is Jesus. And he tells them about Jesus, and he's the fulfillment of everything the Old Testament taught. And they're sitting there going, if he's right, this is life-changing stuff. We'll get back to you, Paul. And they go home. <laughs> and daily. And they conclude he's spot on. And they believe. What? They believe. Doesn't matter if it was the Apostle Paul speaking. He's sharing them the word. It's not about who's teaching. It's about what's being ta taught. Because the last thing we want to do is start a cult of personality, right? Last thing we want is like, well, my pastor says, let me just tell you, it doesn't matter what your pastor says. It matters what the Word of God says. Okay? I know a lot of pastors, some big-name pastors, they love talking about themselves. I don't want to be one of those guys. I don't want, uh, if, if me and Jesus are getting all, uh, equal opportunities, that's my best friend talking. We just ignore him, so. Like, Paul wasn't looking to start the Paul fan club in Berea or Thessalonica, right? If I'm talking about me and Jesus and we've got equal, equal time in the message, there's something wrong there. And if I do talk about me, I'm not going to puff myself up. I'm just going to tell you what a broken man I am and how I desperately need Jesus every day. That's kind of what I'm going to tell you. Uh, I don't have it all figured out. Uh, I, I do know someone who does have it all figured out, and that's Jesus. So I'm going to follow him desperately. Um, I don't need to start a fan club. This is why Paul says to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, why are you all saying, I follow Apollos, or I follow Paul, or I follow Cephas? Here's what Paul says to the church. Was, was Cephas crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Stop with the cult of personality. Stop elevating your pastor and start elevating the word of God. Amen? So here's the questions. Just if you're, if you're wondering, how do you listen to a good sermon? How do you listen to a bad sermon? Here's how I'm going to answer this question. How much of the sermon is actually Scripture? How much Scripture is in the sermon? Is the, is the sermon encouraging holiness? Is the sermon talking about sin? Is the sermon talking about grace? Who's the big character in the sermon? Is it Paul? Is it the preacher? Is it Jesus? I, I love what I do. But I am not above you checking it out for yourself and coming back and saying, hey, Scott, just so you know, I researched everything. We're in agreement. We're good. Or are you going... You said this. That's not what my Bible says. And I sit there and go, cool, let's have a Bible study. And let's dive deeper. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Right? Proverbs 27, right? Let's, let's dive into this. Um, spiritual discernment is available to every believer. Why? Two reasons. Number one, you have the Holy Spirit. And you're part of the holy priesthood of, of, of God. Let me start with that one. Peter says, now that we're in Christ, all of us are part of a new family. We're part of a new humanity. We are part of a, 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 a holy nation. We are part of a royal priesthood. I am no more a pastor than you are in, in the sense that we're in Christ together. And this thing, now we're called the priesthood of God's saints, the priesthood of the saints. And all of us are important in the work of God. Woohoo! I just get the, the privilege of teaching. This is my spiritual gift. I get to teach you. And hopefully you get to teach others by what you're being taught. But the second thing is important. So it's not just the, the, the priesthood, but it's the presence of the Spirit that now helps you understand God's Word. You don't need me. 
to understand Scripture. You can understand it yourself because, again, you've been given the mind of Christ, you've been given the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's role is to teach you all that Christ has taught. You have clarity, you have illumination in the Spirit. Matter of fact, this is why Paul writes to the Corinthian church again in chapter 2 of, of, of 1 Thess- Corinthians. The natural person, so the unsaved person, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. Why? Because they're foolishness to him. But he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Meaning you have no need as a believer in Christ for anyone to teach you. You have all the gifting of of the Spirit to understand the Word on your own. Praise God, though, we live in community where we can all learn from one another. Amen? Amen. So lest I work myself out of a job as I'm speaking to you, I'm telling you right now that it is, I, I, I I would say, borderline idolatry to elevate any single person, pastor, where I need that person to teach me. Right? There are men and women, and I'm going to tell you right now, be careful of following only one person. I pray you listen to a lot of different people. I pray you read a lot of different people. Now, be, be discerning in that, and if you want to run by that list with me, I can do that and say, yeah, they're not so good, or nah, whatever. But I listen to, I mean, I love John Piper, I love Tim Keller, I love C.S. Lewis, obviously, Charles Spurgeon, uh, Augustine, that's going back 1,700 years ago. I love all these guys. And I want to sit under their teaching. I want to learn. But guess what? I don't take everything at face value. I'll hear something like Piper says. Imagine going to Piper and be like, hey, I, I heard this. It didn't sit right with me. I investigated it. Hey, Piper, you're on. You're spot on. Good job. I mean, I wouldn't say that because I admire him so much. But I would do the due diligence of testing it out. Test all things. Test all things. Secondly, spiritual diligence. So you have discernment as a believer in Christ. Now here is where the desire takes takes over. You want to honor God and, and really search it out. If what you're saying is true... It, it demands a response. It, it demands something on my life, right? Now, again, we're not being diligent in examining to be critical. We're not bringing some sort of spiritual snobbery or arrogance and being like, oh, Scott, you said this. Now I want to enter a spiritual d- argument with you. That's, can I just say, I have a hard time with this, especially as I hear other pastors, because my, my default's critical, and I'll be like, yeah, I would never open a sermon with that kind of illustration. Yeah, I wouldn't use that point. No, I would And God just says, hey, Morgan, shut up and listen. Seriously, he says this to me all the time. Like, I'm sitting under someone else's teaching. My go-to is criticism. And God just says, stop being critical because I have a message in there if you just stop thinking about yourself. Because you can really learn anything from anyone if you're willing just to open yourself up to it, as long as it's in accordance with the word, right? But who am I to assume everyone teaches like me or thinks like me or illustrates like me or outlines like me or uses alliteration every single Sunday like me? Today is brought to you by the letter R. Have you not noticed yet? Yeah, it's right there. But diligence says this. I appreciate the challenge This is not going to lead into an argument. This is going to lead to an honest and earnest pursuit of the truth. And let me say something that I want to be very clear. Not only are we to read the Bible devotionally, we're also to read the Bible theologically. Can you write down those two words, devotionally and theologically? Because I'm sure we've all been aware of people and conversations and churches and ministries. Sometimes they're a little lopsided on one or over the other. So you could be so devotional that there's no deeper content that's communicated as far as understanding deeper theological issues. The sovereignty of God, God's omnipresence, God's omnipotence, right? Superlapsarianism. You know, I use all those fancy words because you're like, I have no clue what he just said. He's speaking in tongues. Can someone interpret, right? Like... We're so, we're so wanting to feel, right? The devotion part of our lives hits the feels. But we can't live there. 
See, what, what fuels a passion for devotion is the deeper theological understanding. Elements of the gospel. Why are we sinners? Why is God holy? Why is there the cross? Why did Jesus have to die in my place? What, me, what does forgiveness mean of my sins? And what does now be given his righteousness on my account mean? Like, that's deep stuff. But what that deep theological layer does, it produces a devotional, heartfelt feel that's not just running rampant on subjectivism, but it's rooted in objectivity. So, I don't want to be so academic that it doesn't impact my heart, but I so don't want to be carried away from my heart that I neglect using my head. Does that make sense? Theological, devotional, we want to find a happy, harmony, balance between those two things. Amen? So, why are we talking about this? Because we are, we are quick to forget. Uh, last Sunday, there was this thing called the Super Bowl. And guess what? We haven't forgot about the Super Bowl. Who won the Super Bowl last week? Who cares? No, Kansas City won. Kudos. Here's what, here's what we celebrate, right? We celebrate, hey, you know what? It was a decent game. Um, the, the commercials were okay. You know, there wasn't anything stand out, but I can remember two or three that I was like, I like that. Halftime show? Not bad. I mean, uh, I did not think I was a Rihanna fan until I heard one song after the other. I go, she sings that? She sings that? Okay. Sign me up. I'm in the Rihanna fan club, right? And as, imagine being hoisted hundreds of feet above the ground, being pregnant, surrounded by dancing marshmallows. I mean, this is a good show. <laughs> Matter of fact, one of the dancers in that show was here last night at Sozo. That was cool. So I said, I knew you. You were the one in the white outfit. She looked at me like, yeah, I was that person. So. But here's the thing. Here's the thing we remember Right? Like, think about what happened last Sunday at the Super Bowl and how those conversations carried on throughout the week. I must have had 50 to 60 conversations about the Super Bowl over the course of the next several days after the Super Bowl. Why? Because we relive, we relive those moments, right? Those, those memorable moments. How many, you know, fumbles Hurts had, which I think was only one, and how many touchdowns did Hurts run, or all these statistics, right? And we relive these things at the water cooler. We relive these things among friends. Here's my question to you. How many remember what I taught last Sunday morning in our worship gathering? Good job. Here we go. Like, convicting, isn't it? that we took what we claim to be God's voice. We were open for an hour to hearing his voice, and you know what we all did? We all moved on. And you know what we didn't do is on Monday say, oh, so you remember what Paul said to the Thessalonians in Acts, 7, Acts 17, right? We didn't do that. We didn't relive the moments. Why? We didn't consider them important. But football, oh, you know I know every play, and you know I know the final score. You know I know the winner. Ladies and gentlemen, we can do better. What greater Super Bowl is there than the one who has been victorious over sin and death in the grave? What greater victory has there ever been accomplished than he who holds the key of life and of death? And we have been delivered you and I need to relive these moments this week and be like, remember what Paul said to the Bereans and what the Bereans did? And we sit there and go, yeah, wasn't that awesome? We need to have those conversations. My question is, why aren't we having them? Ladies and gentlemen, let me just say to you, it is a fearful thing to hear a sermon. It is a terrifying thing to open God's word, to read it, and then to walk away because then there comes an accountability. You're not only going to give an account, the Bible says, of the things you say. You're going to give an account of the things that God has said to you. And it is a terrifying thing to fall in the hands of a living God. And like James chapter 1, verse 22 says... Don't be mere hearers of the word, but be doers as well. 
thus deceiving yourselves. This is a holy moment. And every single day, God's speaking to us. And this is our ultimate guide so that we can tell what is right and what is wrong, what is true, what is false. And here's my, great, my biggest concern is we have this word and yet if we don't avail ourselves to it, we all become lost in a sea of relativism. And no wonder there's revivals and awakenings growing, breaking out on college campuses. Because people are like, we do not treat our sexuality the way we've been treating it so, treating it so flippantly. We don't treat social media like we're supposed to be treating it so flippantly. We don't treat our marriages and our parenting and our churches as if the church is just some uh, distributor of, of goods and services and we want to make sure the members are happy and, and the consumeristic mentality that we bring is, is so ruining the church. No wonder a, a awakening and revival is breaking out. You have a zeal for godliness, but you lack the heart of it. Why? Because we're more interested in who's won the Super Bowl than how God has spoken to you that very morning and you forget hours later. I'm guilty. I'm guilty of this. Because my guilt lies in the fact, cool, taught it, now I'm on to the next thing. Rather than living in what has just been shared. See, I'm not yelling at you. I'm yelling at myself. How dare we approach the word, the voice of God, as if, oh, good, there's some tips for better living. There's tips to be more productive in my life. There's tips for a better sex life. There's tips to be more successful. There's suggestions to improve my spiritual health. No, no, no. These are, ladies and gentlemen, the words of wonderful promises, unmitigated commands of a God who knows us better than we know ourselves and is quick to address those things that we fall short in knowing. We all fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of our sin is death. But, don't you love the butts in the Bible? All those butts in the Bible, so good. But God makes us alive in Christ, Ephesians chapter 2. But God offers us the eternal life that comes through Jesus freely, Romans chapter 6. And now there's no condemnation in, for those in Christ Jesus, right? At, uh, Romans chapter 8. And then a few verses later, for the mind set on the spirit leads to life, but the mind that's set on the flesh leads to death. No wonder some of us who may claim to be alive in Christ live a death-like existence. Where's your mind and your heart set, fixated, focused, feeding on? That's why we... The greatest sound that can ever erupt in a church on Sunday mornings is the rustling of pages when your pastor says, turn to this chapter. Come on, you guys. Here's what I'm going to challenge you to do. Stop using your cell phone for your scripture reading. Stop using your tablet for your scripture reading. Stop using any form of social media for your scripture reading. The problem with using your cell phone for scripture reading is you get that notification that comes at the worst time. Oh, my wife's calling me. My son's texting me. Oh, so-and-so won the Super Bowl. <laughs> oh, so-and-so got traded. Oh, President Biden did this. Too many distractions. With this, you don't get those interruptions. Take the word, steal away to a quiet place, leave your phone at home, and take some time 
and pour over the word. Mm. Imagine that. Let us not be negligent of this. You guys can see my Bible. I've had for, it's been rebound twice. It's on the verge of being, need to be re- rebound again. Pages are literally falling out. I'm trying, there's notes all over this. I don't want to lose this. Because you don't know how many times God has spoken to me through this. And I've made notes and I've put dates and significant milestone moments in my life, and one day my kids are going to be like, oh, so what did dad learn? What didn't I learn? There's no greater place to meet God than in his word, in his scripture, and we need to be pouring over this and long for this like a child, baby longs for the milk. Are are you there? Because it's not just diligence that God wants for us to, to test these things and see if they're true, but there's a diet there's a diet. Let's just be honest. Most of us have failed at our diets that we took on as New Year's resolutions already. Amen? But let me just say that's okay because it doesn't matter how many LBs you gain or lose. What matters is how big has your heart grown in your affections for God. That's the diet plan I want to be a part of. And the spiritual diet for these people, look what it says. Don't miss this. They examine the scriptures daily. Not weekly. Because they weren't satisfied to be like, oh man, that was a good meal Sunday morning. Can't wait to eat again next Sunday. Try doing that. Try just eating one morning a week. I mean, we could probably do it. Some guy just died trying to do a 40-day diet the other day. But here's the thing. The Bible is your spiritual oxygen you need for daily living. How many of you can hold your breath for, for a day? <laughs> None of us. I knew a guy who could hold his breath for four, four or five minutes. That was pretty, I can do probably two. But let me just tell you, the more we hold our breath spiritually and don't allow God to speak, you're, you're killing yourselves. Don't go any day without hearing the voice of your father. I love the fact I have men in my life who text me verses every single day. And you know, that that excites me because I read the scripture and then I go, dude, so-and-so's in the word, they're in the word. And we communicate via the word. And my phone is being lit up by men who love Jesus, who want to share the word, what they're reading with others. Do you have people like that in your life? If not, you need to get them. Those are the the, the, the guys, the men and women you need in your life. We as believers need this daily activity. And we need to do it together too. These people did it together. They didn't run off to go find some commentary to see if Paul was saying. They went to the Old Testament. They, they said, does the word support what Paul is saying? And do you know how we do this for you? Look, take out your, your program, your insert that lists all the small groups. Because this is important to our culture, we want you to be in the word throughout the week. And we will do whatever we can to say, your spiritual life consists of more than just Sunday morning. Amen? We have men and women who are opening up their houses, meeting with you. And if you look at that insert of all those, look at how many of them are word focused. We got guys in Ecclesiastes. We have women in Romans. We got women in Revelation. We've got a couple leading an overview of the Bible so that you can understand the 66 books and generally what they're teaching. Everything is word saturated, word oriented. Notice what you don't see 10 steps to make your marriage better. Let me just tell you, you can make your marriage better without the lordship of Christ. It will lead to bitterness without his lordship over it. We are men and women of the word, both theologically and devotionally, daily availing ourselves. So my encouragement to you is jump into a group. Explore the word together. And here's what I would encourage you. Find a group that says, let's take Pastor Scott's notes and do a deep dive. And my hope is that you guys call, come in like as a tribe and be like, hey, we took your message and we looked at it. Good job. Versus coming in and be like, pastor, can we sit down with you? Here's what, I, I welcome that. I welcome that, right? Like I sit there and go, cool, you guys were exploring and wow, you saw things that I didn't see. Or At the end, here's what the, the result is. Encouragement. We'll close with this. Encouragement, and that is uh, responding to the word. Look what happens, verse 12. Many of them therefore believed. 
They took what Paul was saying. They took the scriptures of the Old Testament that they had. They never understood the hero of the Old Testament is Jesus. Paul made that connection, and now they are all worshipers of Jesus. Many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. Wow. Isn't that awesome? This is the impact the word has on lives. And, and here's the encouragement for me as I think about this, is that not everyone will be changed when the word is taught. But the seed of the word will bear fruit in some hearers' lives. That's why back in the day when I was a younger, less experienced man, I would teach the word as if people's lives depended on what I s- said and how I said it. And now I just want to be a vehicle, a vessel. And now I go home and I go, all right, God, I've done my part. I want to be faithful. You do the rest. And that's why I tell you people I sleep like a Calvinist every night. Totally secure in knowing who I am, what I've done, and now the Spirit needs to do what he needs to do in your hearts. But here's what I do know. When the word is taught, people are changed. Will everyone be changed? No. Will some people be changed? Sure. I meet with people all the time. We talk about things. Well, I'll meet with other believers. And they'll say, hey, I've got a topic. Let's talk about it. And we'll open the word. And, and they'll sit there and go, you know, I don't, I don't see that. And I sit there and go, okay, I'm not going to fight you over it. I'm not going to battle you over it. This is not going to turn into an argument. It's, uh, it says what it says. All right. Only God can do the instruction on the heart. And you know what's funny, and we'll close. Paul never writes a letter to the Berean church. He writes a lot of letters to churches. And if you got a letter from Paul, you knew you probably weren't doing well. That's the key. (laughs) See, what I love about the Bereans is that these guys were a healthy church. And no wonder they were healthy. Look at what they did. Gunther sent me a meme this week. So along with verses, I get memes as well. And I'm always up for a good meme. You know what I'm saying? And this one had the Apostle Paul and says, if Paul wrote a letter to the United States, you know, dear the United States churches, right? Uh, where do I begin? <laughs> that, was, that was funny, right? Like, Bereans don't, there's no first or second Bereans in the Bible. Want to know why? Because these people did it right. May the Berean attitude be in us. May the Berean appetite be working in us. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for the voices that have been lifted up in praise and just singing of your glory and singing of your goodness and singing of the gospel that saves us. Thank you for the interaction of seeing one another, the laughter, the hugging, the smiles. Thank you for the opportunity to open your word, to hear perhaps what you would have to say to us. I pray that you have produced ears that hear and eyes that see. Somehow, Father, you have spoken through me by means of your scripture to encourage, to exhort, to uplift, to convict to somehow bring you glory, to to showcase the importance of Jesus Christ and his death upon the cross for us. Without Jesus, we're empty. But with Jesus, we not only have forgiveness of sins, but we have eternal life. May you continue to work that appetite within us to want you more than we want anything else. Forgive us, Father, for feeding upon things that don't satisfy. Help us to want you, your word, your glory every single day. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. Love you guys. Have a great day. Love on someone you haven't met before, all right? We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.